Sound 15, roll 7. On the outskirts of Saskatoon lies a 326-acre forest called the Richard St. Barb Baker Afforestation Area. It was established by the city of Saskatoon in the early 1970s as part of a large forward-thinking plan for a green belt around the city. The plans were never fully developed, and this secret forest was neglected for years. In 2015, a cleanup effort was initiated by members of the Saskatoon community. Tons and tons of garbage, shingles, oil, tires, and needles were removed by 70 members of the community. Over the next five years, they would quietly develop this secret forest into one of the most beautiful urban habitats. The most unique aspect of this story and these community members are that they all share a great admiration for the man of the trees, Richard St. Barb Baker. This is The Legacy of Saskatoon's Secret Forest. What do we plant? What do we plant when we plant a tree? We plant the ship to cross the sea. Yes, we plant the mast to carry the sails. We plant the beams to withstand the gales. I think it's fair to say that St. Barb was the first person to view the entire planet as a living organism that needs conservation on a global scale. He was the, the first person to think of the world's forests as having a global function. I remember thinking, he's kind of like a wizard. He'd kind of draw you into his, his stories, often dropping names of the famous people he'd met, kings and queens and uh, chiefs and presidents. So there was this kind of compelling story of his life that really attracted people. So Bob was a complex person and someone that you can read in many different ways according to uh, who you are. St. Barb had been trained as a soldier, he'd been trained in theology, in science and in forestry. Uh, and so all of these different strands of his training really came to the fore in the image that he represented to the world. North Dale, we thank thee, O God, that we who have no skill or power to paint or sing may yet express by humble toil creativeness, not ours to trace the loveliest flower, nor translate into melody the music of a leafing tree, but we can plant and planting make pictures. He'd obviously learned a lot from his father, who was a, a pastor, uh, and uh, St. Barb was a preacher too. So his ability to speak was, was, was very important. One of the reasons he was in Saskatchewan was that he had a long time relationship with the province. He'd come here in the early part of the, the 20th century as a homesteader. And he had a homestead out at Beaver Creek, just outside of, of Saskatoon. He was a very avid horseman. He made his living partly by buying and selling horses. He grew up as a, as a Christian, was actually in Saskatoon, uh, studying at the Divinity School. But then he became associated with the First Nations people there and started to learn a different way of looking at nature. And so throughout his life, he always credited those people as kind of giving him the inspiration for his uh, really a deep ecological views. Part of what I came to realize as um, St. Barb's genius was that he was able to figure out how to introduce tree planting and environmental responsibility and make it part of the culture of the people he was working with. So often environmental messages or tree planting, they're imposed into a community with the suggestion that it'll be good for you, trust me, just do it. 
But St. Barb always took the time to figure out how do you make tree planting, environmental responsibility, part of the culture of any given community so that they own it and it lives on in that culture as a permanent feature. And to me, that that capacity was was true genius. It first took form when St. Barb was working in Kenya in the early 1920s, and he was trying to encourage the Kikuyu tribespeople. He approached them to say, you know, why don't you plant some trees? But they weren't particularly interested. And so he realized that within their local farming culture, every important activity was accompanied by a dance. There was a dance when the crop was planted. There was a dance when it was harvested. And so he invited the local tribesmen to a dance of the trees. Thousands of, of Kukuyu warriors in full regalia, shields and spears, took part in the first dance of the trees. And that's how the Men of the Trees organization was founded and eventually became International Tree Foundation. For someone of his stature and his legacy, you always felt as though in some ways he was an observer to his own life's success and impact. He was able to bring other people in to connect with that legacy because he did not claim ownership over it. Would you like to put it? He opened up psychic space inside of me, just him being there. And I could just kind of think about St. Barb and go sideways into this, like, what I call a tree portal. As a child, he'd had this kind of ecstatic, mystical experience in the woods near his farm where he just felt totally a kind of a cosmic opening. One thing that keeps recurring and is obviously very important is the Baha'i. And we really haven't said anything about it. I wonder if you could tell us about, you know, just what the essence of Baha'i is and what it means to you. It's the main theme is the oneness of mankind, the oneness of all inspired religion and the importance of independent investigation of truth. I'd first been drawn to the Baha'i faith in the highlands of Kenya in 1921, I suppose, when I was seeking for something to satisfy my uh, other side than scientific nature. He was a visionary way ahead of his time. And I think that was partly due to his spiritual background and training as a Baha'i, really caring for others, caring for the planet. And he was also ahead of his time, I think, in recognizing, even before James Lovelock formulated the Gaia hypothesis, that the Earth is a living being and that we need to care for that living being. He set off from London, you know, with uh, specially equipped uh, vehicles to uh, go across the Sahara. So, you know, you're undertaking a major expedition to travel that distance with the technology that they had and with his intention that he would film along the way, speak to locals and do their own sort of biophysical survey of the uh, Saharan terrain is very ambitious. He had a real charisma. He was able to recount stories in detail to the extent that afterwards, when you read his books, a number of those stories would be almost verbatim from his written accounts. He could move from one episode of his life to another and regale an audience with descriptions and stories. I'm putting forward Sahara reclamation as a one world purpose. It's something big enough to need the concerted action of every country. The literary estate, which is now the archival collection at the University of Saskatchewan, includes the books that he wrote, of which there were 30 over his lifetime, but then all the working manuscripts and material related to the organization of the Men of the Trees. And you see the really wide connections he had, ranging from just the average person who is interested in trees to, you know, President Roosevelt to the royal family. And he was active right up until the last day of his life. Join hands, ye nations. This is the last call. 
Join hands ere the play ends and the curtains fall. Gun and bomb and sword have had their play. Now for the living word and the king's way. Let peace be the bridegroom. If he is denied, death will take his place and earth will be the bride. It is few to say. Join hands, ye nations. This is the last call. Join hands ere the play ends and the curtains fall. This hybrid poplar tree was planted on June 5th, World Environment Day 1982, on St. Barb Baker's last visit to Saskatoon. St. Barb Baker had arrived uh, quite uh, ill, worn out, I guess you could say, in his 92nd year. We all would remark that how can this man keep going? And it was uh, sort of inevitable that probably this was, this was his last trip and he's gonna die along the way, you know. But just as we were getting him out of bed, uh, our flight was for 11. Uh, about nine o'clock, he died in our arms. It's a, it completes a very big circle. He died in a place that he felt very close to and was important to him. St. Barb had many times told me that he wanted to be buried beneath two tall trees. The Baha'i community took charge um, of the arrangements for his burial, and it happened that the Baha'i community owned a plot in one of the old cemeteries in Saskatoon and wouldn't you know, there are two enormous trees just next to the grave where he was finally buried. St. Barb did the very first thing that tree huggers are talked about. He went out and hugged a tree and said, this is how I recharge my batteries. You have to have a special tree friend and just feel the energy coming up from the ground and, re and recharging your whole being. <laughs> And that's why he developed that, you know, what he called the message of the trees. Stand firm, root, your roots going on down the ground, feel your groundedness. Stand firm, grip hard, thrust upward to the sky like a tree. Wave your branches, bend to the winds of heaven and no tranquility. He, he understood the power of myth and symbol. And of course, the tree is a symbol throughout history in all religions. And he, he drew on those images when he spoke so that he energized people at a, at a deeper level, at an archetypal level. Make of me a hollow reed from which the pith of self hath been blown, that I may become a clear channel through which thy love may flow to others. In the trees, the Lord is loving to his little birds, the linnets and the finches and the nightingales, they people his pavilions with nests and with music. And when I die, may my body be laid to rest at the roots of a tall tree, so that my spirit may arise in the branches and give thanks. He that planteth a tree is a servant of God, he provideth a kindness for many generations, and faces that he hath not seen shall bless him.